Good evening, and uh, thank you for a very productive and meaningful exchange among businesses between India and Sri Lanka. I'll start with being thankful to the chambers of uh, commerce and industry, that is the CIA and the FICI, for readily agreeing to come along during this visit of mine. And the other delegations who have come, being invited by the High Commissioner and also by the teams of the MEA and so on. So first of all, thank you for doing this. I'm indeed grateful also to the Chamber of Commerce of Ceylon for presenting here, being present here, and presenting some of your top uh, business houses to speak and to voice the concerns. The intention of such a meeting is that. And here, we start from a very strong footing. In July, when uh, the president of uh, Sri Lanka had visited India, Together with Prime Minister Modi, they had declared or issued a vision statement, which was briefly recalled by one of the speakers. It essentially covers many of the areas which each one of you all have spoken about. And those are the areas in which India and Sri Lanka stand to benefit by greater cooperation. We need to have common areas quickly identified. We don't have time to lose. And why do I say that? India is growing fast. It's the fastest growing economy. We are showing our macroeconomic fundamentals, which are absolutely strong. And on that, we are able to rapidly build confidence and grow faster. Now, Sri Lanka needs that. And uh, I'm, I'm conscious when I'm talking because the quickness with which you have come out of the recent troubles shows that there is inherent strength in the entrepreneurship here. And having reached a middle income economy status, the recent trouble should not worry you, but although I dare not advise any economy, I will give a few suggestions which are very much what you probably recognize. Tourism and tea are your signatures. There's no way you're going to lose that. Certainly that will be one of your primary, one or two of your primary uh, strengths for your economy. But there's no harm, I would think, if we are making efforts to widen the economy basket. And in that, energy, as is declared by the statement, vision statement of the two leaders, energy is a big item which can enter that basket. And when I say enter the basket, it's because Sri Lanka stands on a natural advantage footing. Solar and wind energy are of big ticket items which investments can rush in. Why should any investment come to a sector and will that benefit you or not will be a natural curiosity question. Sri Lanka needs power, energy. It needs energy at an affordable rate. It needs energy for its businesses to thrive. It needs energy also for the plantations and the welfare of the plantation workers and so on. So I think if you go by India's experience, I'm sure there are representatives of renewable energy from India here, and uh, I'm only speaking in very approximate numbers terms. Those of you who are um, in that field can always correct me. At least five, six years ago, or seven years ago, per unit cost of solar energy in India would be somewhere between 14 to 15 rupees, 14.35, 14.45. With acute competition and favorable government policy, with the interest 
coming out of India's nationally determined commitments given in Paris COP21. We saw healthy competition and India in solar power today is able to produce per watt, uh, per unit cost of 2 rupee 45 paisa. Where was 14 odd and where is 2 plus? And that, and that is purely the healthy competition that Indian entrepreneurs gotten into. And that is not to say uh, it's a country where you know you gave free land, free this, free that. No, on a very conservative note, policy facilitated a lot of things. That today we have some of the biggest solar power parks producing several hundred uh, watts, megawatts, that we are able to look at 2030 as one of the speakers said early, was it Subraganta, saying we will be producing 500 gigawatts by then. Unimaginable for me who have come or who have lived and grown in India, a country of power shortages. As it is, we are self-sufficient. But we can produce more, we can invest more, we can develop more. And when I therefore suggest with some audacity, pardon me, Chamber of Commerce Ceylon, that tea and tourism will certainly have to be your signature and top of the agenda, because you've shown brilliance in that. But look at energy as well. Look at pharma as well. Look at many other sectors in which your resources and endowments have not been tapped. And I was giving this example to the Honorable Prime Minister when I met him earlier in the evening today, that India's attempt to become energy self-sufficient, of course, like many other visionary steps which Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi has launched in India in the last 10 years, India has seen such remarkable changes couldn't have been for nothing because you had three top leadership position uh, industry business houses before you talking. The example of vaccine was given by Suchitra Ella. It's one thing to encourage industry to produce even during difficult times and industry to stand up and meet the challenge. But it's, it's another, totally a different uh, matter when the governance institutions in the country, down to the bottom most uh, unit, administrative unit, the villages, far-flung areas, very difficult in communication, also within a time span, get that vaccine which has been produced and have citizens inoculated. India proved that governance being right, you can scale up to any extent. Delivering on the vaccine is one example, but quickly I'll move on to also the other example, which is another scaling up proposition on which of course the High Commissioner is engaged with Sri Lanka to talk as to how digital public infrastructure can benefit in financial inclusion and thereby digitizing the financial realm itself. India has achieved a lot of transparency and being a part of the Asian economy, Sri Lanka would be happy to know that having brought in digital benefit transfers to citizens into their account, into the bank accounts which they did not have earlier from 2014, there was a different drive to have bank accounts open for every citizen. So using digital technology, when we transferred money directly to the people who are listed out as beneficiaries, eligible beneficiaries, we have saved a lot of public taxpayers' money, brought in transparency into the system, gave no place for middlemen. And within the first two, three years of doing it, through only central government schemes, and that too, not all of them, if I'm right, about 45 schemes, we've saved 2 lakh crores 
of public taxpayers' money. So why do I talk about scaling up and why do I talk about uh, digital public infrastructure even as I'm talking about the vaccine? When we get into technology, economies benefit, whether it is starting from identity, use digital identity, use financial inclusion through digital accounts, government benefits being transferred with technology. Technology as an instrument to scale up. It brings in several unknown, unexpected benefits. Transparency is one of them and very important one of them. So uh, without expanding on uh, too many items, I think Sri Lanka and India stand to benefit. There's one other tempting point which I don't want to miss out on. In the global situation that we are living in, Honorable Prime Minister, when he was here, before he left, was expressing anxiety about what is going to happen because of the global, uh, you know, Middle East war, a war in Russia and Ukraine, fuel prices might spike up. So that concern is there in everybody's mind. Global multilateral treaties are now receding. Whether it's for the good or bad, I'm not commenting. It's not happening. People are not wanting, about, wanting to talk about multilateral agreements. There's more now. It might revive. I'm not closing the door on it. But now there is a greater interest in regional, you know, get together and bilateral, so that you make sure your economy is protected your economy is going to be sure of facing uncertainties. So there is this, you can see all over the world now, a clear interest in wanting to have bilateral arrangements, arrangements in regional currencies. Arrangement so that you ensure that there, there are not going to be shocks because of currency volatility arrangements so that there are no foreign exchange driven crises. Arrangements so that you're sure between the two countries, roughly understanding the strengths of each of the economy, you're able to be sure that your food security will be in place. Your energy is not going to go through a you know, roller coaster ride. And therefore, countries think it is better to have regional arrangements where you know one another country or bilateral arrangement where you know you have assessed for yourself. Now, should India and Sri Lanka also benefit from such an arrangement? I would think a big yes. Because there, is, there are so many commonalities. Similarly, there are also so many opportunities. So I would think for the set of industries which have come from India, all top notch, and for the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce, the task is cut out. It is for us now to make sure that India and Sri Lanka can have some economy integration of some sort so the supply chains are all effectively managed. So no foreign exchange crisis, or no dependence. Nobody is expecting to be dependent on any one economy, but yet for logistical costs, for inputs in time, for some of the products which are essential but yet not completely produced for yourself, this kind of an arrangement would be of benefit for both our people. I would. Uh, invite the Indian industries who have come here to have very meaningful point-to-point -point conversations with your counterparts in Ceylon, Sri Lanka. I see huge and immense potential for you to talk with them and for them to also exchange thoughts with you. The governments in both the countries are keen 
to facilitate any process that would help industry to grow. At least I'm very clear that Prime Minister Modi is keen that our neighborhood first policy would extend and also the statement which was issued in July, which is a vision statement, can take us forward in this direction. So it is getting late. I'm sure there's a lot more to hear from one another. But thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. There's great future for both our countries. And we look forward to working together. Thank you. Thank you very much.